Hines graduated from Bethany College in West Virginia with a bachelor's degree in psychology. He received his master's degree in elementary education, professional diploma in school district administration, and doctorate in educational administration from Dallin College. Dr. Hines also received educational training from New York University, Harvard University, and Stony Brook University in the areas of school leadership, school business affairs, and organizational learning. Most important, he is an advocate for saving our public schools. Thanks, Lord. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank certainly Laura and everyone for, for, for being here uh, this evening. Uh, I could listen to David and I could listen to Joe all night long. And you probably saw me in the back, I was taking pictures because uh, I, I hear them speak all the time, but it's always, I feel like it's like the first time every time I, I hear them. And what I'd like to do is to start off with one of my favorite quotes from Winston Churchill. And when I spoke here, I believe it was in March or April, I used the same quote, but I think it's really timely now. Uh, just as much as it was back then. Kites rise highest, highest against the wind, not with it. And I'm going to tell you right now, we are certainly rising very, very high. When I, I, I had everything scripted here, and I'm scrapping it right now because of not only what David and Joe and Warren were sharing before, because I just want to speak to you from the heart as far as the way I perceive things, the way that I see things. Um, and on the side, I just want to say hi to my sister over here. My sister, uh, I have three uh, beautiful uh, nieces who uh, attend our West Islip School District here. So I want to thank you for... Uh, I'm a little disabled, but I certainly uh, I feel very near and dear to, to this uh, school community. So my, my question that I want to start off with, and it's really a rhetorical question, I'm going to look at the camera as I say this because I think many people probably may have the same question with the same answer. When was the last time the New York State Education Department or the United States Department of Education actually did something good or well or positive? And you know, all right, so I'm 44. I, I can't think in 44 years. The I mean, really, the last time something positive that has moved forward. And if you look at what transpired yesterday with this commission, and my colleagues and I were, were joking around, it's really the omission. It's the omission of the people who should be there, who are, in my estimation, should have a balanced perspective as far as what's best for the kids, our children, in New York State. It's not there right now, it's one-sided. So the Irish, the Italian, and the German in me is very inflamed right now. <laughs> and as Hulk would say, Hulk smashed. And that's why I'm trying to be very good right now. Because I'm, I'm genuinely upset with what's happening. And I think about what it means for our teachers, what it means for our parents, what it means for the administrators, what it means for superintendents, who in some ways are really, really handcuffed by the, uh, the simplicity and the insanity of what is happening right now. Now you're sitting here because I think you know, you're all in agreement. I'm preaching to the choir right now. And one of the things that I really wanted to focus on tonight has to do with what can we do in our school districts, this is gonna sound kind of crazy, but to protect ourselves from what's happening right now. And, and as I talked to our staff in Patchwork Medford, I called the bubble. What can we do? I mean, this is a crazy way of thinking. To put a bubble around us like the invisible lady from Fantastic Four, she put a bubble around her. Like, what can we do to put a bubble around us to protect us from what's happening? And I have some ideas because, you know, these ideas that I have, I don't, I don't think it's rocket science. I think many of us have good ideas. The hard part is actually taking an idea and, and moving it forward. And how do you move something forward in a school district when all these things are coming down when you're forced to do something that you don't want to do. So I boiled it down to three things. And it comes down to leadership, it comes down to communication, and it always comes down to relationships. The relationships that the superintendent has with the board, the relationships that the teacher union and the teachers themselves have with administration, 
what are some of the things that we're doing to connect the community. So everyone is on the same page when this insanity is rolling down. Now the problem is, you're gonna have different mindsets. Like if I say George Bush, some people are gonna go, George Bush, great. And some people are gonna go, George Bush, I don't know. Everyone has their own mental models of what's good and bad. But I can tell you right now, what I'm trying to do in Patchwork Medford, and I'm not saying that this will happen everywhere, but this is what I think has to happen in our school districts. We have to remove the egos, we have to remove the old mental models of, as Joe was saying, us versus them. Not us versus them from the standpoint of you know, people who have a lot and the people who don't have a lot. I'm saying the old mental models of two rams on the mountaintop butting heads. So here's what I propose to school leaders. It's a, it's a suggestion in, in these times. We have to work with each other. We won't always agree with what's best, but we have to have that human connection of respect when we're talking with people and we're working with people. So I don't know about you, but John Maxwell was one of my favorite authors when it comes to school leadership. And every leader in our school district read something called the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Now again, this isn't rocket science. Uh, you can probably read this in the night. But I'm going to tell you right now, the guiding principles behind that has to do with relationships and working with people. Many of you may have heard about this book already, Professional Capital, from Michael Fulham and Annie Hargraves. Here's the real premise behind this book. We're gonna trust you as educators to make informed decisions because you work with kids. We're gonna talk about what's best for kids and then we're gonna actually design a framework within the school district, God forbid, to have you actually collaborate with one another. Mm. One of the biggest problems that we have in school districts right now has to do with the fact that we have the old model of the industrial revolution where we are producing widgets and we're on a Pavlovian clock 42 minutes later we drool and then the kids go somewhere and everything, you know how we, we keep doing that. We have to design and the board, the boards of education have to support this through policy. Having teachers built into their school day time to work with one another without kids there, to work on curriculum, to have constructive conversations, to talk about what's best for kids. It's a design thing that we have to come up with. But school administrators have to say, you know what, that's important, we have to work to make that happen. That's the only way we're going to see a change within our schools, because the beautiful slideshow that David showed us before, I was really jealous, I don't know about you, but I saw some of those slides, I'm like, oh my god, I wish we had some of those things. Um, and if the community can support that, that's wonderful. But that has to do with the fact that we all have to work together to do what's best for kids. And it has to do with me sitting down as a superintendent with the teacher union president or the administrative union president and actually meeting either somewhere in the middle or having some common ground. And not to use this as an opportunity to take something that's insane and make it worse and, and use it to the advantage of, you know what, I don't like getting along with people so I'm gonna use it to my advantage and use it as a lever and make it worse. We can't do that, we have to go the opposite way. So what does this mean? Make a long story longer as I tell my friends is this. The board and the superintendent have to be one. They have to be on the same page. I feel I can't do anything in my school district unless I work very closely with my teacher union president and the administration president. It's because I can have all these ideas that I think are good and they won't go anywhere if I'm not working with someone. I'm going to tell you right now, if we're not working together at this point, then we might as well throw our hands up in the air. Because this is one of, I mean, historically, we'll, we'll read about this 10 years, 15 years from now, and we will go, that was crazy. I can't believe we actually lived through that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to even fathom, I, I have five kids. I have five, I'm standing, I have five kids. <laughs> <laughs> From 14 years old to three months. My kids are going to be in the schools for a very, very long time. So I certainly have a fight to, to, you know, to think about, not only for my kids, but certainly for the community that I serve. Having that, that thought process of, we are school leaders, we may be school leaders, but you have to have a service type of mental model where we are, we are serving you. 
I look at I look at it this way. We're serving the community. We want to make sure. I look at the job as a superintendent that we want to enable and make sure that as teachers or educators, you get what you need to do what you have to do in the classroom. And again, this isn't rocket science, but this is the shift that has to take place. So when you see, see this commission come about, see this commission come about, and you look at the educators that are there, I'm not saying they're good or bad, but I think there are only two. Mm -hmm. One superintendent, I think one teacher, that's an elementary school teacher, I believe. And then you have charter school people on there, and then you have all these other people. That, to me, is just a real declaration of we're in this for the long haul, and this isn't changing at all. So let me, let me end by talking about something that I feel is really important, because I, I can guarantee if I ask this question to 50 different people, I'll get 50 different answers. And the question is, what is the purpose of going to school? What is the real purpose? And you hear all these wonderful quotes, and, and you hear all these great stories. But if you boil down the purpose of being in school, it's really to learn. And I saw something online the other day that I thought was just so great, so I'm gonna end with this. Do we send our children to school to be measured or to, or to be taught? If the answer is taught, why are we spending so much time measuring them? And that's really it in a nutshell. I mean, I, I, I feel like the purpose of school from the reformers is to measure ad nauseum, to measure everything. And then once you get that data, what do you actually do with it? When I think back to the people who are making these decisions, and this is what should get you angry, is that they're sending their kids to schools that do just the opposite. I mean, think about that, they, it's the opposite. So whether it's the common core standards, they're not there. Whether it's three through eight testing, that's not there. When I went to the Dalton School, I didn't go there, but when I looked at the website, and I looked at the <laughs> curriculum that was there, and I looked at the experiences that one could have, it's the complete opposite of what they're proposing for our children. I'm getting angry even talking about it. Like my octave is going up, like I, I can feel it. My ears are getting red. That's, that's an, it's, as I would say in my classroom voice, that's inappropriate. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you right now, and I agree with Joe, this opt-out number, I mean 500,000, I think he's almost being conservative. It, it actually may be higher. Because if you're not upset with what you're seeing right now by the people who are making these, making these insane decisions, this is where you come in, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a parent. You know, when these legislators go back in January, you better be chirping in their ears. You better be yapping, saying, if you don't do what we feel is best for our children, you're gone. And that's it in a nutshell. So I really thank you for being here today. This is the first step of what we have to do for the rest of this year. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So thank you very much.